Good morning, friends. Welcome to OBE Journal 2018, number 20. I'm going to continue on directly from the reading of number 19. Uh, such an interesting uh, text it is. And um, let's go over the last few lines. Um, Fortunately, the psychiatrist diagnosed schizophrenia and he was detained in a psychiatric unit. He is now free. And he is also free of the ghost which possessed him. What helped me in taking my decision about Roger's fate was a documentary I saw a few years ago about murderers in prisons around the world, made by French television. The condemned people were men and women. Prisoners answered questions given them by the reporters. They talked very openly about their lives, about what had led to the murders, like they wanted to warn others that their lives and those of those dear to them can end just as quickly. Some of them spoke straight to the camera. Others covered their faces, ashamed to show themselves. Others, again, spoke only into a microphone behind the closed doors of the prison cell. Every one of them had killed someone very close to them. The common feature of all the cases was that the prisoners remembered absolutely nothing about the moment the murder was committed. They claimed that they loved the murdered person very much, that at the moment of death they didn't love them one iota less, that the murders weren't preceded by any argument or disagreement. One of the women killed her brother. She spoke about him with great love and tenderness. She couldn't understand how she could have done such a thing. If she had been indifferent to him or hated him, then the event would have been in some way explicable. But they were exceptionally good to each other. The brother used to drop by on his way home from work virtually every day to say hello and ask her how she was and give her a kiss. That day he had done the same thing. She was in the kitchen cutting something. It lasted a fraction of a second and he was dead. All of these accounts, even though they were filmed in different prisons and the crimes were committed by people of various nationalities, faiths and levels of education, were almost identical. These people were concentrating on something, then came a gap in their awareness and someone close to them was dead. One could claim that this was completely impossible to think that the prisoners were only justifying themselves in front of the camera and that their accounts were highly embellished. This would make sense if they were all waiting for the verdicts, but each of these people had been inside for several years and they were therefore telling the stories long after the murders and they had a long time to consider them. What's more, none of them wanted to get out of jail feeling that there is no punishment fitting the crime they committed. As I write these words, the television is showing a documentary from a German prison where a serial killer of women is doing his sentence. He is a young, intelligent man whom nobody would have suspected of doing anything untoward. In the interview, he said, I wouldn't have done it if, at the moment of the murder, I'd been able to control myself. The moment of killing is like a film to him, which he isn't taking part in, just watching. He felt a compulsion over which he had no control. I checked to see if in his case too his actions were directed by a murderer of ghosts. It turns out that it was. It continues to sit inside him and I guess that he will kill again as soon as the opportunity to. I could help this man but I'd need to find him or his family. Even if I did do it, he would still have to do his sentence for many years to come. No one, after all, will trust him or risk letting him go free and therefore exposing a potential victim to danger. You'll ask why things happen this way. From my experience, I know that there are murderer ghosts which kill just for killing's sake. They desire blood. A person committing a murder is rarely a murderer in his own right. He is merely a puppet carrying out the murders. This doesn't mean, of course, that such a person should be judged innocent. For as long as he 
he has a ghost or ghost inside him, he will continue to kill. That's what serial killers do. A person who commits murders without any concrete motives is sometimes also a victim, of which he is not aware. The ghost throws him out of his own body and after committing a murder gives it back to him along with the consequences. I hear about ejecting people from their bodies quite often along with the many drastic, less drastic matters. What often happens is that someone I already helped who has self-awareness and awareness of ghosts may phone me and complain that they're being ejected out of their bodies by a ghost which won't let them back in. They ask me what they can do. Of course it's quite possible to help them, but how many people in the world are aware of this? Only a handful. What happens most often is that a person who is not aware will do something which is against their own selves or against the law. May go to prison or, at best, a psychiatric hospital. Often for many years, if not for life. I've personally come across similar cases to those in the documentary. They have convinced me that I am not mistaken. During one of my trips, a woman came up to me in the street and told me who I was and in her first words said, Mrs. Pratnika, I killed someone, but I've served my sentence. This directness took me aback somewhat, and I didn't really know how to reply. But she hurriedly went on. You know, in a jail, a person has a lot of time to think about things. I knew I would find you here, and I came here specifically from abroad. I'd like you to help me understand what could have caused me to perform the act of murder. My husband and I never even had any disagreements, let alone arguments or fights. We were messing about with the dog. We were kidding about like little kids. And the next thing, he was dead. Can you appreciate how much I suffered of, as a result of that? I couldn't even say goodbye to him, be at his funeral. And all those years of thinking about it, I thought I wouldn't be able to stand it. It was even worse than prison. If they had given me the death sentence, I'd have been glad, because I'd have been with him right away. But as it is, my torment was endless. I checked the cause of her action. She was possessed at the time by a ghost which brought about her husband's death. Furthermore, it was still inside of her. When we discovered whose ghost it was, she cried out astonished. Is it her? She always said she'd take him back from me and that I would regret that he'd chosen me, and she kept her word. She sighed. When I made contact with the ghost, it transpired that the perpetrator of the murder was very disappointed by the turn of events. She had no benefit from her actions. She had induced her to murder, anticipating that that way she would bring back the loved one, that she would keep him at her side. Unfortunately for her, after his death, he went straight to the light, not stopping with her even for a second. She was left with a great sense of guilt inside of her and a fear of punishment. I had to perform therapy for both the ladies, the woman ghost and the woman who had been innocently sentenced for the murder of her beloved husband. It took a long time for the woman ghost to forgive herself. When the woman speaking with me forgave her too, she was happy and left for the other world. Examining the reasons why ghosts direct people to murder or suicide, I come to the conclusion that there are as many reasons as there are causes. Every case can be different. It can, for instance, simply be a case of desire for vengeance. The ghost may think, since I was not allowed to go to the other world at the appropriate time, then, now, since I am not alive, let others die too. Another cause can be paying back retaliation because the ghosts felt themselves to be unloved or the victims of brutality or were themselves murdered. The worst reason is killing just for the sake of killing. For some reason the ghost likes it. Performing a murder brings a satisfaction and a sense of power. It feels itself to be damned already so one case more or less makes no difference to it. Instead of condemning such a ghost however one can always help it. Show it to the road to recovery. It will help the ghost and prevent more disasters. Um, 
I should mention, I suppose at this point, that uh, in all the literature that I've come across, I've uh, not seen uh, what I've been reporting in my own uh, <clears throat> experiences in number uh, 18, is it? <clears throat> uh, ghosts, earthbound ghosts from wars, uh, such as the one with ISIS, and not just them, others, um, have uh, this desire to go on uh, uh, killing in any way they can, which is uh, sometimes uh, in provoking, uh, how shall we say, weak-minded sympathizers to uh, go into shootings and uh, mass shootings. And um, some of the most weak-minded are the PSTD sufferers from the Iraq war or the Afghanistan war. And um, perhaps that phenomenon is no, so new no one's written about it yet. Um, but um, I think you can see the mechanism and the motivation uh, from these cases, very similar. Um, haunted houses, chapter called Haunted Houses. Give an example of uh, jealousy of uh, possessions and wealth, which uh, some ghosts have. Uh, I'll give you an example. There was a very wealthy businessman who, through his garage, uh, contained a Mercedes S and several other fine cars on his firm. And he, but he constantly had the urge to wash and look after his old decrepit Trabant. He spent virtually every spare moment in the garage. His family put up with this eccentricity bravely for years. They consoled themselves with the reflection that there are worse addictions in the world. Although he devoted all his free time to this obsession, at least he was at home. Then the Trabant started to disintegrate in some strange way. Its owner reacted to this even more strangely. He simply went berserk. Because of this incident, the family found its way to me. When I started to check if there was any connection between the car and its owner's sickness, I found that there was, and quite a strong one. Many years previously, before the man started to run his own business, he bought the Trabant, unaware of the fact that its previous owner had very nearly caused an accident. This huge stress set off a heart attack, and he died at the wheel. The car had been everything in his life, his only possession. After his death, he stayed with it, and whenever the opportunity arose, uh, particularly when the businessman had drunk alcohol, he entered the new owner. As a ghost, he looked after his property very conscientiously. When I led the ghost away, the man who had been possessed by it awoke as if from a long sleep. He was amazed at, by the strength of possession and that he hadn't even noticed it. In everyday life, he was a serious, wealthy man. He often repeated, Lucky for me, the ghost was so possessive it didn't want to drive the old crate around town. I would never have lived it down. When someone realizes that they can't take their property with them and when they don't want to leave it to anyone, they resolve to stay with it forever. Even if they will it to a relative under the pressure of approaching death, they will take it back anyway. There's another kind of ghost which visits houses that never belong to them. You'll remember, or some of you might remember, in one of my earlier talks, I can't remember which one, um, talking about, well, it was actually a, a, an exploration of going to the, uh, it's a museum piece now, a very fancy mansion in Toronto called Castle Loma, which is open to the public and uh, you know, has many visitors over the years. And you can find ghosts in it almost any night of the week. And they, they don't do any harm. They just pre pretend that they're living there. They have lots of fun. 
These are ghosts who were in their lives very grasping in their pursuit of wealth, who were even ready to kill for it. Oh, I won't find anything like that at Castle Loma. Um, they acquired fortunes in a cruel way. They were guided by the lowest instincts, and after their deaths, nothing has straight changed. They are every bit as ruthless and grasping, ready to kill anyone who wants to trespass on their territory. The desire to acquire wealth gave people like that enormous strength, cruelty and fearlessness. It is with the same strength that the ghosts guard their treasures, not allowing anyone to get close to them. Let us not assume, however, that there is an enormous treasure hidden behind the doors of every haunted house. The concept of a fortune is very relative. What represents great worth to one person will, to another, be worthless and barely good enough for the garbage tip. So ghosts guard their gains, which in their subjective assessment are very valuable. Here's an example. A ghost who was haunting a particular house had in its life been someone who preyed on old ladies. In the majority of cases, his booty considers, considers of the old lady's pension or the dimes left from them. These old ladies, who weren't particularly attached to the money, gave it up to him willingly. Others defended their money to the end and lost everything, including their health and their lives. At the end, it turned out he was killing for a couple of pennies. Now as a ghost, it guards what he looted as if it were the greatest of treasures. It remembers how hard he had to work to acquire it, going as far as to commit murder. The ghost doesn't realize that it is of very little worth. In its view, this is a great treasure. It will be prepared to kill to protect a cheap picture hanging on the wall of a house that it is haunting. This house, although it is a hovel, represents something very valuable compared to the sums he looted from the old ladies. A ghost like that won't allow anyone inside, will do anything to smoke the owners out of there. Its greed gives it the strength which other ghosts don't have after their death. It is unreconciled with though arguments can persuade it. That is why some houses stand empty for years. They decline, but no one is able to live in them, nor can they knock it down unless the ghost decides to let them. Anyway, many more stories. Wanda's book is uh, filled with such tales. I uh, picked on the, uh, the grimmer ones because I thought that's what we needed to hear in this reference. William Baldwin, Healing Lost Souls, uh, almost a foundational text for uh, people in this line of work. 2003 it was published. His work uh, goes prior to that, however. Many uh, interesting tales of spirit releasement from William Baldwin. Um, let's have a few. His, uh, his work influenced many others. And we will see references to him and his work from other uh, practitioners. Marion was in her mid-thirties, a recovering alcoholic and drug addict. The first attached entity that spoke through her voice was a, her deceased boyfriend. He had died of a cocaine overdose. His body had been found in a sauna. As she went into an altered state, she had an image of the inside of the sauna, which she had never seen before. She was recalling the memories of his death. After his death, she had become a serious cocaine addict. See, there you go. She even knew where a supplier lived, though she never had met the man or been to his home. This had always puzzled her, and the session gave her the answers. The boyfriend was continuing his habit through her. He agreed to leave her and go into the light. 
one of the attached entities discovered in her first session was a fragment of her 84-year-old Aunt Dolly. A scan of past lives revealed that Marion had been Dolly's daughter in a previous life. Dolly loved Marion as one of her own children. With the assistance of her higher self and her spirit guides, the fragment of Dolly was sent back to integrate with her own consciousness. Marion immediately felt stronger and clearer minded and had more energy. A few weeks later, Dolly fell and broke her hip. With trepidation, Marion visited her in the hospital. During the week following the visits, Marion felt increasingly tired and depressed. In her second session, it was discovered that the fragment had returned. Before sending the fragment back again, a remote spirit releasement was conducted on Dolly. There were several attached uh, earthbounds with her, including a deceased boyfriend who had given Dolly some of his mother's china and silver after her death. His mother was also attached, still angry that her son had given her beautiful things to a woman he wasn't planning to marry. After they were released into the light, the fragment was once again sent back, accompanied by her spirit guides. It did not return to Marion. During a later visit to her aunt's hospital room, Marion played the tape of her first session for her cousins, Dolly's daughter. When they heard the conversation with the mind fragment of Dolly, they recognized their mother's voice mannerisms and inflections. Joan and the Nanny. An entity, can, an entity can attach to or be associated with a subpersonality. The subpersonality can actually be holding on to the entity. The trauma that caused the split is still painfully active for the subpersonality. And the strong need can be a magnet for the entity, even if it just wants to be released. Joan, a female client in her late 40s, disclosed that she had not had a meaningful love relationship with another person and did not particularly miss the interaction. She suspected that an attached entity was the root of this situation. Her father had died when she was about six years old and she recalled standing beside his grave and looking down at the coffin. She knew her daddy was in there but did not understand why he would not return. At the time, she was wearing black patent leather shoes and a pinafore dress, and she wore her hair in long pigtails. Direct questioning uncovered an attached entity almost immediately. Dr. B. <laughs> Is there someone else here with Joan? Client. Yes. The entity had been a nanny who had loved children. In spirit, she had felt drawn to the location of a cemetery where a little girl stood looking for Lauren. The child was dressed in black patent leather shoes and a pinafore dress, and her hair was in long pigtails. The nanny came to comfort the child, and she had stayed. The child needed no one else. She had sent her nanny. Sorry, she had her nanny. The nanny was ready to leave, but could not seem to lift off toward the light. Guides from the light were present. No other entities were attached to the nanny and no unfinished business kept her attached. There was no apparent resistance on her part. I addressed the entity. Dr. B, is there a part of this woman who is holding on to you? C, yes, the little child standing behind, beside the grave. I directed Joan to visualize the scene at the gravesite, to kneel down by the little girl in pigtails and hold out her arms to her. She described the child turning and running into her arms. Joan's arms wrapped around herself as she described the feeling of the child hugging her so hard. It felt wonderful. I called softly to the nanny. Can you go now? Yes. The nanny moved to the light as Joan continued hugging the little girl, her own subpersonality, her own inner child. The present adult person is the only one who understands what the child went through. The pain, loss, anger, and frustration. The adult is the only one who still cares about the incident. The parents known by the child are now much older, if not deceased, and only see their child as the adult she has become. The child's subpersonality is asked to trust her adult self, the one she became. 
the evidence proves that she survived the trauma that caused the split. She no longer needs to continue existence in that void of suffering. Nearly all clients discover these two conditions, their own soul fragmentation and the entity attachment, some of which are soul fragments of people living and dead. The condition of fragmentation adds a new dimension to the process of spirit releasement therapy. Recovery of soul fragmentation is essential in part life therapy, past life therapy, and spirit releasement therapy. Um, Baldwin has uh, a lot of uh, experiences with what he calls DFEs or dark force entities. To say they come from the dark side is uh, almost a given. From ancient times to the present day, religious literature has depicted the polarity of light and dark either as a schism within God as source or arising from different sources. He goes through uh, various religious dualisms throughout the world. Principles of evils clearly define devils. And, you know, the basic tenet of the philosophy being the forces of good and evil constantly war over the soul of man. And, uh, you know, coming down to us as the, uh, you know, the stories of the good angel on one shoulder and the bad angel on the other. In our Western culture, even in churches, the existence of Lucifer, the Prince of Darkness, with legions of demons in his command, is considered symbolic, metaphoric, even mythical. Whether the forces of darkness are a figment of imagination, a product of zealous prophets, a thought form creation of a collective unconscious, or someone, something else unknown, speculations regarding good and evil will continue unabated. In counseling practice, there is little room for religious conjecture. If the client discovers such intrusive dark force entities, we deal with them. We neither philosophize nor offer useless platitudes. People seem to be susceptible to interference by DFEs in the normal course of living. Mental distortion caused by alcohol or drugs can cause vulnerability to such attachment. Sexual interaction with someone infested with DFEs allows the exchange of these entities. Feelings of intense anger, hatred, rage, and vengeance open the door for demonic infestation. Greed and desire for power and control over others, of men over women, corporate executives over their employees, rulers and kings over their subjects and in some cases neighboring countries, fanatical terrorists, politicians and positions of power, all create an invitation to DFEs. Well, there we go, a mention of fanatical terrorists. I hadn't noticed that before. Here's an interesting point. A warrior going into battle will often pray to God for protection and strength. Such a call to God goes unanswered. God does not help one soldier kill another soldier. In desperation, the warrior may call on the forces of darkness for protection. The dark side quickly offers to protect this trained killer. This offer of invincibility is too much to resist, and in the heat of battle, the warrior says yes. And from that moment, his soul is in bondage to the dark forces. The offer of protection is meaningless, like so many millions of other soldiers who have, and like so many millions of soldiers who have uselessly lost their lives. Many warriors who have called on the dark forces' protection die in battle. However, the bargain with the dark side was made willingly, and the DFEs enforced such a pact. And because of the integrity of the divine spirit, the human soul honors the bargain. Interesting. The human soul honors the bargain. 
The DFEs are hostile, arrogant, defiant, disruptive, and generally very unpleasant. They swear profusely, using obscenity and foul language, but not profanity. Hmm. They never utter holy names. Ha! Huh, that's not my experience. Um, not that I've had a lot of experience in these, these matters, but I have had some. And um, one entity said to me, something like, this is years ago, you're not going to give me that mealy mouth Christian shit, are you? Something like that. Um, of course, that's not, well, that is sort of profane by some standards. But anyway, um, um, here's some more. They interfere with any and every form of love. This includes self-esteem in the individual, even to the point of suicide, conjugal love for couples. This can lead to separation and divorce, even domestic violence and murder, and familial love and respect, disru disruption of family unity and loss of the healing potential of love in a family is a pr primary assignment and major accomplishment. They attempt to interfere with projects and institutions that can advance and improve the human condition. DFEs understand only the energy of the three lower chakras. Survival, fear, threat, lust, greed, power, antagonism, competition, control, bullying. They resemble the human ego at its worst. The inevitable uh, quote from the New Testament, Revelation 12, and now war broke out in heaven when Michael with his angels attacked the dragon Lucifer. We've all seen that one before. In a session, the client is guided in discovering the source, origin, or cause of any condition they seek to change or heal. The source of many human problems and conflicts often turns out to be an attached entity. When an entity is discovered and we suspect a DFE, several specific questions are directed, i.e., what is your per principle and purpose here? The purpose is usually to stop, block, disrupt, destroy, protect, or in some way interfere with the person. How have you affected her life, emotionally, mentally? Who sent you? These may name Lucifer as the Dark One or some such description. This confirms the identification of a DFE attachment. More than at any other time, the DFE enters at the age of three. <laughs> Reasons for this have not yet been discovered. How many lifetimes, including this one, have you been with him or her like this? Recall the first time, how did you connect with her? The connection may have been at a time of violence, such as sexual abuse, beating, burning at the stake. The person may have been accessible because of fear or intoxication, perhaps a warrior going into battle. In the late Middle Ages, opposition to suspected witchcraft became violent during the so-called witch craze that rampaged through Europe from about 1450 to 1700. Thousands of people, mostly women and usually innocent, were executed for diabolical witchcraft. Most of them burned at the stake. The alleged witch was often a healer, a herbalist, gentle woman with psychic abilities who communicate with the plants and animals. This ability usually aroused suspicion in people, especially those who were dominated by the teaching of the church. These women were often attacked by the very people whose children they had healed. As the flames engulfed their bodies, many of these spiritually gifted women in excruciating pain would angrily call out a curse against the townspeople who had betrayed them. The dark forces always energized such a curse, and the curses carried out against the target person or persons. Also, DFEs can see this as permission to join the woman who uttered the curse in that moment of panic. They may consider an invitation or a pact. Many clients have recalled the existence on our planet hundreds of millennia ago. Hundreds of millennia. 
Even then, proto-humans had a sense of the dark intruders. A number of clients have described these black things resembling, resembling paradactyls, the flying dinosaur type creature. These intruders seem to descend from the sky in groups and simply enter individuals, inevitably in times of violence between uh, people or clans. Anger would attract the DFEs or perhaps the dark entities would enter and instigate the violence. So such behavior is not new on our planet. The following is a typical interchange with a bound DFE speaking through the voice of the client. What did your superiors tell you would happen if you approached the light or if the light came close to you? They said it would burn. They told me I would be destroyed. The third deception is that the light will harm you. Is that burning? Is it burning? Yes, it's burning. This is often the intimate, immediate reaction because they will believe it will burn. Is it destroying you? Are you being destroyed? No. Look again. Is it burning? Well, no. Did they lie to you? Yes. The light will not harm you in any way. Are you being destroyed? No. Did they lie to you? Yes. The second deception is that you can be destroyed, that you can cease to exist. In truth, you are an eternal spirit being. You cannot be destroyed. What's happening to your edges as the capsule squeezes tighter? They're getting fuzzy, they're fading, they're turning gray, they're disappearing. There is very little belligerence at this point. The dark entity's focus has been diverted from its assignment with the client to grave concern for its own survival. With a little assistance, it begins to understand that it has been deceived. Turn and look deep inside yourself. Begin to focus deep inside. Tunnel to your center, to the very center of your being. What do you find? Nothing, it's just dark. Keep looking. What did they tell you was inside you at your center? There is nothing here except darkness and hate. Keep looking. Through the darkness, through the layers of blackness. Keep looking. Keep going right into your center. What do you see there? Look carefully. There is some light, just a little spark. They deceived you. They told you there was no light inside at your center. That is the first deception. This light is the spark of God consciousness at the center of your being, which gives you eternal life. Once you believe the first deception, you will believe the second deception, that you can be destroyed. After that, you will believe anything. They'll tell you the light is harmful, that it will burn and you must stay away from it. If you obey, you will never learn about the light. How does it feel to know they deceived you from the beginning? I don't like it. I'm angry. They lied to me. Would you continue to serve these masters who deceived you like this? No. The light inside has been described as a flicker, a spark, a little flame, a red coal, a pearl, a diamond, a crystal, a sun. What happens to that little light as you continue to watch it? It's glowing brighter. It's getting bigger. This always happens with this type of entity. Move close to it. How does it feel? Does it burn? No, it doesn't burn. It feels warm. Step into it. It is your light, the center of your being. Step right into it. Stand tall in your own light. How does that feel? Once the dark has been stepped into its own light, the dark being, that is, the darkness is gone. It's like throwing a light switch in a dark room. It's warm. It's peaceful. How long since you've felt warm and peaceful? I don't remember. Do you like it? Yes. What has happened to your dark form, the darkness we first saw? It's gone. Would you make a new choice? Will you choose for the light? Yes. Choose for the light. Declare it. I choose the light. I choose the light. We witness your declaration. The universe recognizes your choice, and so it is. This is the transformation of a demon, a dark force entity, and it is generally following this pattern. It is a straightforward therapeutic approach that can be learned and practiced by any open-minded therapist. This is a releasement or exorcism of a demon, not from the adversarial position of a priest, not with rancor and animosity towards this foul thing, but from a compassionate stance of tough love for a God-created being who went astray. 
Long ago, the spirit made a serious error of mind and chose the dark path. It has caused untold misery to countless beings. It has also suffered its own pain in the darkness. There is a great deal more involved in the process than this brief description would suggest. Yet this is the final outcome in nearly every case. There has been criticism of this method of sending demons to the light. Fear, which drives religious zeal, allows no possibility of redemption for those who rebelled against God. They believe the God light or the heavenly place will be contaminated by this intrusion of darkness. This view of God is limited and false. These errant dark beings are transformed by discovering the truth of what they are. They drop their illusion of darkness before returning to the light, and the place they are taken to by the rescue spirits of the light is safe, both for them and the light. They are prodigal sons, and Lucifer, once a favorite of God, is the ultimate prodigal son. That's from Healing Lost Souls by William J. Baldwin. And uh, once again, we've uh, come close to our time. And uh, there is more, more examples I would like to give you from other books. People like uh, Sue Allen and Louise Island Frey. And uh, we'll get to that very soon. And um, until then, uh, <laughs> treasure the light, <laughs> as I'm sure you do.